Welcome back. So in the last video, we were looking at uh, the how to find equilibria of population models, uh, how if those are expressed in terms of continuous time, in some DNDT, we said that DNDT equal to zero. Uh, if equilibrium are expressed in terms of discrete time, some n of t plus one is some function of n, then our equilibrium occurs when n of t plus one equals n of t equals just n, you know, basically where the subscripts don't matter. Uh, and we were able to, in both cases, to solve for equilibria. Uh, in this next video, what we we're going to talk about is, well, which equilibrium do you actually end up at? Which is another way of saying uh, which equilibria are stable. Uh, if you're perturbed away from them, you tend to return back to them. And which equilibria are unstable? If you are perturbed away from them, you tend to keep moving away from them. So uh, pretty common uh, metaphor for thinking about stability is to think about this idea of balls rolling into valleys or rolling off the tops of hills. So if you whether you're thinking about a valley or the top of the hill, they both have a point that is in equilibrium, a point where there's no change uh, where the slope is zero. And if the slope is zero and flat, you know, nothing's going to change. So obviously the bottom of valley has an equilibrium where nothing's going to change, but so does the top of the hill. There's a, there is a point where the slope is flat and a ball on that point would stay there. But it's very clear that that on a point uh, location is unstable. Any perturbation away from it, you're going to roll uh, strongly in one direction to the other. So it's not uh, to understand the dynamics of a system, it's not simply uh, sufficient to know where the equilibrium are, it's very important to know whether they're stable or unstable. Uh, and actually, a generally important thing to know uh, for, for models is that whenever there's multiple equilibrium, uh, there's going to be some that are stable and some that are unstable. And uh, there's a tendency for them to alternate for reasons that will become clearer once we start diving into the graphical analysis of equilibria. So how do we figure out whether an equilibrium is stable or not? So let's think about this in the generic sense. And let's start by focusing on discrete time models. So we have some generic model, n of t plus 1 is some function of n of t. Uh, and we have some equilibrium n hat. And let's say we already know, we've already solved for those equilibria. So how we understand the idea of stability is to think about this idea. If we had this equilibrium n hat and we were perturbed away from it by some small amount uh, epsilon, uh, would we return back to n hat? And if so, how quickly? Uh, so if, if we're perturbed away and we return back quickly, we're stable. If we return back slowly, we're less stable. And if we uh, move away when we're just uh, displaced a little bit, then we are unstable. And this should uh, remind you very much of our discussion of sensitivity to initial conditions in the logistic model. Because again, in that case, we were looking at uh, you know, literally doing a computer simulation of that idea of displacement, you know, in, in you know, creating a value that was very close to our, our initial condition and seeing did we return. Did, they, did, did both trajectories converge or did the trajectories diverge? Exact same concept, but now we're going to do it analytically rather than just through simulation. So if we define that perturbation as uh, epsilon as a difference between n at time t and the equilibrium, uh, basically what we want to do is write down a model that tells us about the magnitude of that displacement, that epsilon, that perturbation. OK, and so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, actually approximate that. And so we're going to be able to say that epsilon at time t plus 1 is going to be approximately the slope of our function uh, solved at n hat times the magnitude of the displacement. And that slope we're going to call lambda. Uh, 
And that lambda is going to give us an indication of whether we're sloping uh, back to down towards uh, the equilibrium or sloping away from it. So in discrete time, there's some important criteria here. First, uh, if the magnitude of lambda, the you know the measurement of how uh, the population model is changing as you change n, uh, solved at the equilibrium, if that uh, magnitude of lambda is smaller than one, then the size of the displacement in the next time step is going to be smaller than the displacement of the time step. So if I had you know say an, say lambda was one half and our epsilon was one. And so if we started at epsilon of one, then epsilon of one times one half would give us one half. One half times one half is a quarter, uh, an eighth, a 16th, a 32nd, a 64th, a 128th. You can kind of see that if this is smaller than one, then every time we multiply it, uh, by the previous perturbation, it's going to get smaller. And that's exactly the same thing that we were doing when we were doing exponential growth. So uh, and we're very analogous concept, but we're now instead of thinking about the growth of the population, we're thinking about uh, the magnitude of this perturbation. Is that perturbation growing or shrinking? And it's going to shrink any time uh, lambda is greater less than one. And that was very directly analogous to the our big R population growth rate being less than one. So that is going to be our, our criteria for stability. The other thing that to note is um, there's the second half of this criteria, which determines whether the, the um, displacement oscillates or not. So if you remember when we were looking at the the logistic population growth as it, you know, just looking at it by itself, we saw that there was sometimes in, in some ranges of parameters, this tendency uh, to overshoot uh, and then, but then oscillate back towards the equilibrium. And so you can imagine th this is, you know, again, we're thinking about this in the generic sense, but you can imagine for that logistic model, we had that, that we saw that that pattern could occur. You know, if we were a little bit above uh, the carrying capacity, we would come back down, but we would overshoot back down below, and then we'd shoot back up above, then we'd shoot down below. We'd converge exponentially back to the equilibrium, but we were oscillating. That oscillatory behavior be is whenever this lambda is negative. And that makes sense because if this lambda is negative, then it, let's say epsilon at this time, time is positive, we multiply it by negative number, it'll be negative next time. Then it's negative, we multiply it negative number, we get back to a positive. So if this lambda is uh, negative, then every iteration we flip the sign. And so we just uh, come back in this oscillatory behavior. So if we look at this uh, next, this next graphic shows this, these four possible things that could be happening uh, in terms of the stability of a discrete time model. So again, if it's between if it's if the magnitudes between zero and one, it's stable. If the magnitude's bigger than one or less than negative one, it's unstable. If it's positive, it's converging smoothly or diverging smoothly. If it's negative, it's oscillating. So that gives us uh, for our largest lambda, we're diverging. And we're diverging smoothly uh, between zero and one. We're converging smoothly um, between zero and minus one. We're converging, but we're oscillating. So that's kind of our damped oscillations. And our lambda less than negative one, uh, we're diverging and we're diverging in an oscillatory manner. So the next thing I wanted to do is look at how we might understand this graphically, uh, because it's one thing to do the math, but it can turn out um, that it can often be easier to get an intuition for what 
these equilibrium are by just looking at a graph of the model itself. And so this model, this graph here represents how the, the, the population at some point t and the population at t plus one. So what's called p here is what we've been thinking of as n. Um, so it's telling us about the population growth rate. Um, if we're making this plot between p of t plus one and p of t or n of t plus one and n and t, uh, this line describes the model itself as we would have written it down because we've written down the model of you know, n of t plus one as a function of n of t. So that's what the model looks like. And this diagonal defines that one-to-one -one line. Now remember our criteria for an equilibrium is when n of t equals n of t plus one, which is basically any point on that one-to-one -one line. So first of all, graphically, you can find an equilibrium as on a um, with a discrete time model just by looking for the places uh, where the, the model crosses the one-to-one -one line because that's gonna define case, cases of equilibrium. Uh, next, what we wanna look at is um, what is the population doing in between those equilibria? So first of all, let's consider this first case here from zero up to this, sec this first equilibrium at zero to the second equilibrium in the midpoint. Well, in between, look at the places in between here. If n of t is 0.4, then n of t plus one is less, is below that one-to-one -one line. That below that one-to-one -one line means the population at the next time point is gonna be smaller uh, than it is right now because the one-to-one -one line would correspond to it being the same. So if, if it's at 0.4, not, it won't be at 0.4 the next time point, it'll be less than 0.4. So that means the population is getting smaller. And so at any point, between this equilibrium and this equilibrium, uh, the population is getting smaller uh, at each time point. And so you kind of drawing in these arrows indicating that if you're in this range, you're going to be declining. So that declining towards zero helps us understand that this equilibrium at zero is stable in the sense that if you were perturbed away from it, population growth rate would be declining and you'd return back to it. Okay, next let's consider this range uh, between the middle equilibrium and, and one. So let's say I'm at 0.8. If I'm at 0.8, um, not changing would be along again on the one-to-one -one line, but now our model predicts a point larger than that. That means the population of the next time point is larger than the population of the current time point is above the one-to-one -one line. Uh, and so that would be increasing. So that would uh, kind of move us away, move us upward. So we're increasing in that range because the next time point is bigger than the current time point. And so that means this middle point is unstable. It's like that top of a hill. If you're at that point, you're fine. But if you are perturbed away from it, uh, you're going to move, you know, if you're perturbed away in, in a downward direction, you're going to move down to this equilibrium at zero. If you're perturbed away from it in the other direction, you're going to move up to this equilibrium at zero. And you can do the same analysis at points above one. Well, at points above one, uh, the population at the next point of time is smaller than the population right now. And so that's going to be declining. And then we kind of see this stable equilibrium at one, because you know if you're below it, you're getting pushed up. If you're above it, you're getting pushed down. And that's kind of like being in the valley. So graphically, we can kind of see those equilibrium and we can also see that they're stable. And we can also relate this to this idea of lambda because lambda is, you know, that d function dn, df dn, uh, evaluated at the equilibrium. So it's it literally is the slope of this line at that equilibrium. And so here, uh, the slope of this line at this middle equilibrium is, uh, greater than one. Uh, so that implies uh, that your uh, 
divergent and not only are you divergent, but you're smoothly divergent. Um, and here the slope of the line crossing at that equilibrium is less than one, which implies that it's stable. Um, and similarly, the slope of the line here is less than one, implying it's stable. So both of these are stable and non-oscillatory. This one is unstable and non-oscillatory. And the point that's worth making is uh, they always alternate. So if I know this one is stable, this one has to be unstable, and this one has to be stable because they can't flip. You can't have the arrows go in one direction and then get to this point and then have the arrows keep going upward or else, because that wouldn't be an equilibrium. They have to be switching sides. Likewise, if I'm crossing this line at a slope bigger than one here, uh, to cross here, the slope has to be le less than one and vice versa. So just mathematically, it's basically impossible to have equilibria do anything other than alternate, um, which is a really good hint if you're trying to find them. Once you found one and you're convinced of it, you know they're gonna alternate. And also remember, it's, you know, uh, zero is always an equilibrium, just a matter of figuring out whether it's a stable equilibrium or not. In this case, it's, it's stable, but it isn't always. There's lots of situations where uh, if you're at zero, extinct, but you increase away from zero, you have some invasion of, uh, from outside uh, that the population will grow uh, away from that equilibrium. Cool. So that wraps up this lecture on how we find uh, the equilibria of discrete time models, how we figure out if they're stable, how we do that mathematically using perturbation analyses, and how we do that graphically. I will say uh, I would generally recommend that one start with the graphical interpretation as the much more easy way of doing this, but be aware that the analytical version exists. It exists in you know, kind of exists in a textbook sort of thing. You can look it up. If you need to dive into it, you should be aware that it, it is there. Uh, it does require a derivative, but not usually not a hard one because um, it's just the first derivative of the model of, and population models usually aren't that complicated. Um, but the graphical model tells us other, some really other insightful things like that really what matters is where these equilibrium are and the slope as you cross them, and that a lot of the rest of the behavior of the system at a high level, you know, at a high level of the behavior doesn't really depend much on the shape of the line in between those points. Uh, obviously, you know, again, if you want to predict the transient dynamics accurately, it depends on getting that shape right. But in terms of understanding the high level uh, options for where the equilibrium are and are they stable or unstable, which is where things are going to go in the long run. Um, mo what's most important to that are where these equilibrium are and whether you're, you know, whether you're crossing them in one direction or the other. Cool. So in the next video, we're going to continue thinking about stability analysis, but we're going to do it from uh, thinking about continuous time models.